I used to play guitar. My first instruments were uh, was guitar, actually. Okay. I think it was because that was the one instrument my mom didn't really want me to play. <laughs> so I, I took guitar. Can you jam out on the guitar? <laughs> yep. She's a nice. harpist. Okay. She, she was a harpist and a pianist. She did not She was did not like the guitar, so I went for the guitar. Lynn, but I started yeah. because I wanted to be a fiddler. <laughs> Okay. okay. <laughs> I wanted to play okay. an Appalachian fiddle. That's what sort of inspired yeah. <laughs> the learning okay. the violin. Gosh. So I think one of the best sayings anyone ever told me was, uh, rehearsals are not to learn your part. Your rehearsals are to learn everyone else's but, part. <laughs> I learned just as much from teaching as I do from learning. I mean, learning as you teach is a big part of why musicians teach. Sure. Um, and of course, you know, some will tell you it's because it's, it's a consistent sort of aspect of what we do. But... A big part of it is you will always learn a lot from watching other people learn it for the first time. Yeah. And if you think about it, word of mouth is the best advertising as far as yeah. getting an immediate response. Yeah. Because I know that whenever um, somebody tells me firsthand that they've had a good experience with a business or with a service, I'm more likely to go than if I just saw it on social media. Oh, and yeah. so I did leave it up to Paul. I did leave it up to my husband to kind of do the final say because he was the one who was nervous. And then finally he said, yep, let's do it. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Let's let's go for it. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we went ahead for it. Our students were super excited and we started to grow before we actually entered the space just because people knew a space was coming. Oh, no way. Which was super cool. Again, we learned very early and I think COVID influenced this a lot too. We learned that if you are not constantly pursuing what you want to do, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. it's not going to fall into your lap. It's not just going to happen. You yeah. have to constantly be pushing. You have to be hungry for what you want. I like being able to go into a coffee shop where the owner already knows what I want. You know, I like being able to go into the grocery store and see people that I know and, and yeah. recognize them. I, I yeah. like that experience, that that um, that safe feeling of knowing that you you walk home from somewhere knowing that you can wave to like three or four people you know on the way. Welcome to the Yard of Business. I'm your host, Eric Baker. I sit down with entrepreneurs right here in Dade City and the surrounding areas to find out about their backgrounds, how they built their businesses and what their secrets for success are. Today, I'm joined with Miss Charlotte Lewis. Charlotte is the founder and owner of Prelude Academy of the Arts. Prelude Academy of the Arts provides quality education in the performing arts through private lessons, group workshops, and live performances. They are located at 14249 7th Street in Dade City, Florida. You can also find them at PreludeAcademy. Ms. Charlotte Lewis is a classically trained violinist. She has a degree from USF in violin performance. She's performed in multiple different orchestras and music festivals. She's an ambassador for the Dade City Chamber of Commerce. She's an entrepreneur. She's a business owner. She has her physical storefront in downtown Dade City. Her passion for music and for teaching is genuine and quite infectious as well. Her face lights up when she talks about teaching her students. I really enjoyed this conversation. Her upbeat and positive outlook left a smile on my face, and I'm sure it's going to do the same for you as well. Frankly, she has a really impressive resume, and we talk about all of it. But before we just jump into it, I ask her about NaNoWriMo. Wow, you did your homework. Yes. I uh, <laughs> so NaNoWriMo, it's National Rhymo. Yeah, National Novel Writing Month. And um, before I decided to go to school for music, I actually was interested in the creative writing aspect of English. And so I was writing short stories. I wrote my first novel that year. And no the um, yeah, the way that you win National Novel Writing Month is uh, you write a novel of 50,000 words at least within 30 days. Okay. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I had a really good time. I wrote some, it was fiction at the time that I was writing. And... Uh, Oh, it was it was a lot of fun. I haven't had a chance to win since. That yeah. was probably the only time I had uh, the only chance I had the time to sit down and write something that long. What, but, what'd, you, what'd you write? What was it? <laughs> oh, if I, it's been so long. I remember. I think that it was. I remember it was fiction. I think that it was a small town setting. I don't remember all the details. I should go revisit that now that we've brought it up. <laughs> but okay. I've always been interested in creative writing. So awesome! Oh, well, fantastic! <laughs> so let's uh, let's just start here and let's let's set the foundation. Let's build the bigger picture. So <laughs> let's talk about you. Let's talk about your background. I understand that you have an Appalachian heritage. So I do so. 
tell us about your background. Are, are you an only child? What were you like as a kid? Did, did, you, did you always want to be involved in music? I mean, just give us the story of Miss Charlotte Lewis. Sure. Well, first of all, Appalachian. Appalachian. I'm sorry. Uh, yep. If you ever go there, <laughs> they'll know. Yeah. You got to say, it's like, like I'm going to throw an Appalachia. That's got, what oh, they say. Okay. Got it. Got it. <laughs> yep. So um, I'm actually, I like to tell people that I'm the youngest snowbird. Okay. So my um, parents, when I was about 14, and I'm the youngest of three, so my, my brother and my sister are quite a bit older than I am. Okay. And uh, when I was about 14, my dad retired and my mom decided we are going to go pursue this project in West Virginia. And so they purchased a, an 1890s coal company store. It was about 18,000 square feet. Huh. And those were the social hubs of the coal camp communities. Okay. And so the building was beautiful. It was it was four stories and hand operated freight elevator. It had two walk-in vaults. It was just this awesome building that was being um, left to ruins. Basically it was falling apart and needed a lot of work. So they decided for their retirement, they were going to take on a huge project <laughs> and bring me along with them. Yeah. And in fact, our whole family ended up going along with them. So my brother, Victor and my sister, Holly and myself, we all went up with them to overhaul this project. And so we were seasonal between Dade city and West Virginia. This was in Whipple, uh, over near the New River Gorge Bridge in Fayette County. And we would go back and forth between these two locations. And, um, you know, no one really wants to work in a building with no heat in the middle of the winter. So we opened it up as a seasonal museum to bring people in. We gave um, tours. We taught them about the architecture. We taught them about coal camp history. Um, and this all came from my mom's heritage. She's originally from West Virginia and um, has a lot of deep roots in Southern Appalachia. Okay. So, uh, up until then I was homeschooled and uh, that was what allowed us to do this back and forth was, uh, I didn't have the restriction of going to a, a school system where I had to be back by a certain time. So gotcha. we went back and forth for uh, about 13 years after okay. that. And, uh, really loved it learned a lot about people and business and nonprofit organizations we learned a lot a lot and we really enjoyed all the opportunities it brought we got to work with different festivals we got to work with um, different organizations we got to learn about doing all these different kinds of history tours everything from architecture to women's history to haunted history the building had a reputation of being extremely haunted Uh, it was it was a fascinating uh, time to be growing up in so it was A lot of fun uh, all throughout, and especially since I was homeschooled, we were involved in the arts before and during this time. We were always involved in um, theater and music, and more specifically theater, because um, as a kid, we were really involved in Dade City's Arts in Motion. We were really involved in Dade City's Showstoppers. We did a lot of our arts education here in town growing up, and uh, not really in the classical realm, though, until I was almost 16. We were in West Virginia, and I started taking, um, I had dabbled with violin before, but I started taking more serious lessons right before I turned 16, Mm, and uh, started doing uh, my classical training at that point. So a lot of things I already knew about music and theater transferred, but it was also a new world of learning the discipline of learning the violin. But I yeah. started because I wanted to be a fiddler. Okay. okay. <laughs> I wanted to play okay. an Appalachian fiddle. That's what sort of inspired yeah. <laughs> the learning okay. the violin. Gotcha. So it was, uh, it was definitely a great experience. I found a sort of a small group of people in Fayette County that were focusing on teaching kids how to play violin and how to play other classical instruments, things like harp and cello, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so I got involved with them, found a great teacher. He was very young at the time. Now I think that he's concert master. I I want to say the Cincinnati Symphony, um, if I'm not mistaken. But he uh, was a great teacher. I took from him for a little while, took from a uh, Suzuki Method teacher, which was a really great classical method for violin education. And that was sort of what got me involved with classical violin. They had a youth symphony that I joined. Um, I was pushed to join it pretty quickly. So uh, a lot of it was a sink or swim experience. I remember a lot of the people around me had been playing violin since they were four or five years old. Mm -hmm. And here I was at 16 trying to pick it up pretty much for the first time. And uh, I had a lot of catch up to do. (laughs) Sure, 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 sure. Okay, right on. Awesome. So (laughs) you're a classically trained violinist. Mm -hmm. What is classically trained? Is there a other ways? So you said the Suzuki method. Mm -hmm. Are there other ways to be trained? Sure. There's been a lot of different methods of 
music education over the years, usually classically trained basically means that we are learning in a very traditional sense um, technique, how to read sheet music the correct way, learning a lot about music history. A lot of elements go into classical training. And usually it means that you studied with somebody that really knew the art and the theory behind the instrument from the get-go. And so I I went through a series of teachers because we moved back and forth a lot, but um, all of them had really interesting backgrounds rooted in classical music in general. Okay. And so the inspiration for learning to play the violin was you wanted to play the fiddle. I wanted to play Devil Went Down to Georgia. (laughs) (laughs) Well, did you? (laughs) Eventually. (laughs) I I play it for weddings occasionally. (laughs) Right on, right on. uh, What kind of violin do you play? So right now, it's actually a wedding gift from a student of mine. It is a 1930s German violin. Okay. So I figured if it survived a war, it could survive me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And typically, German violins have a very deep sound very similar to um, the German language usually a very sort of um, brisk and sort of aggressive sounding you know voice to it which I really enjoy Um, so that was something that was gifted to me and I've really enjoyed playing it ever since so Gotcha. What are some of the different types of violins? So I, I did some, there's like a classical, there's an electric. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. What are some of the different types of violins? There are so many different types. Typically classically trained musicians go for um, the older instruments or the instruments by a reputable luthier. Okay. Usually they go for um, instruments that are made out of different, some people are very adamant about what kind of wood they should be made out of and yeah. what kind of elements are part of it. But now um, with the, I would say Lindsey Sterling sort of, led the team on this whole electric violin movement where everyone wants this a sort of electric violin look kind of similar to an electric guitar it looks good on stage it can be amplified really easily so a lot of people play that um okay okay carbon fiber violins are becoming really popular so they're essentially weatherproof and you can use them for a lot of outdoor sort of gigs um we prefer acoustic instruments in general just we're old school we like that resonant sound we like the organic sound that they give off so that's what i've stuck to so far but i might venture into electric violence (laughs) in the future just for fun okay oh yeah so you're an active performer in both classical Mm -hmm. and contemporary music yes what can you tell me the difference between the two sure is is so I did some, is classical music just played in modern times? Is that really the definition of it? <laughs> is is it's classical like, music just dead guys? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, ri- written by dead guys? No, no. So classical music, um, the way we use the term loosely, sort of encompasses all music um, created before the 20th century in general. People kind of uh, overhead it with that. But in reality, we have lots of different... Um, periods of music just like we have different periods of art you know we have renaissance we have medieval we have classical we have romantic we have all these different periods but people tend to sort of umbrella classical as anything before the 20th century okay got (laughs) it so contemporary though and we can look at contemporary a couple of different ways there's contemporary music like what we might listen to on the radio and then there's classical contemporary or more serious contemporary music where it is Music written in a more serious setting, like a conservatory or a university, Mm -hmm. um, by a modern day composer who is basically breaking all the rules that we set in classical periods. So Mm. we set all these rules out, you know, these are the notes that sound good together, these are the notes that don't, these are the types of things that we can do with the structure of the music. And then in the 20th to 21st century, we kind of broke all of those rules and decided, Mm. you know, we're going to do whatever we want to really give people this idea of... um, it's, it's more about what we can make the audience think or feel rather than what the structure is. And so I got really fascinated with contemporary music when I was going to USF. Okay. And I played really actively with the um, contemporary composers. I was also dating one, so that helped. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I all eventually married my favorite composer. So. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, we played a lot of contemporary music in school. And um, I was actually part of the New Music Consortium which was a group that just worked with contemporary music. And um, it was very, it was a very fun organization. I was one of the very few um, female members because uh, composition is kind of a male dominated area. Mm. And even though mm. I don't write music, I played for composers all the time. Sometimes I was doing two or three different recitals a week with these contemporary composers. It was mm. just, I liked the idea of being the first person to play something yeah. and to bring it to life. Cause you know, we can't, dig up Mozart and ask you know exactly <laughs> how you wanted this played yeah, yeah. but we could go and ask these living composers like hey you 
well, how do you want this to sound? What do you want this to be like for the audience? Yeah. So I really enjoyed that. I got really involved with that. Awesome. Okay. So, and so, and you touched on it a little bit, you have performed in several different orchestras. So mm-hmm. I've, I've got here and there might be other ones. Mm-hmm. So forgive me if I'm leaving a few off here. So the USF symphony orchestra, the USF honors orchestra, the South so- South shore Symph- symphony orchestra mm-hmm. and the Dade city symphony. So how did you get involved with them? So the university orchestra is pretty obvious. I mean, I was at school. Uh, yeah. The USF Symphony Orchestra was a requirement for my degree. So we were, uh, as a violin performance major, I was required to be a part of that orchestra, which, I mean, what an awesome experience. The conductor there was phenomenal. Being a part of all these other musicians who were just really incredible. Some people had been training their entire lives. So it was a mm-hmm, great experience mm-hmm. playing with those people. Um, and then, of course, uh, the world gets smaller when you become a, a professional musician because uh, then you get involved in this orchestra and then someone says, well, you should come play for this one. Um, they play good music. Um, they pay well. They have snacks. You know, we all have a variety yeah, 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 of reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that's kind of how we spread to that. And then the Date City's t- uh, the Dade City Symphony, I actually played with them before I even went to get my degree. Um, mm. They've been around for about, uh, I think, 10 or 11 years now. Okay. And um, that local symphony has grown quite a bit. I think it started with about 10 members, and now we're up to, I think, 40. Oh, wow. And uh, we're, we're getting closer and closer to a full-sized orchestra. And, What's uh, a full-sized orchestra? Uh, usually around 60, but it varies. 60. It depends okay. on what they're playing, and it depends on what other instruments they want to bring in. Gotcha. Um, but my, uh, that's how actually where I met my husband was the Dade City Symphony. Oh, nice. So, yeah, okay. he, uh, he played double bass at the time. So. Okay, right on. So mm-hmm. what's it like to play in an orchestra? I mean, what's it, is there a lot of preparation? Like, what, what, what's involved? In oh, the, yes. In- yeah, actually, a lot of your preparation um, is done beforehand. A lot of your preparation is done on your own. So sure. I think one of the best sayings anyone ever told me was, uh, rehearsals are not to learn your part. Your rehearsals are to learn everyone else's part. <laughs> So we, (laughs) right. So I do too. And so we would, we would be sent music ahead of time. Oftentimes with these more professional, um, orchestras, it would be music you may have played before because a lot of times, because there's such a vast classical repertoire, um, eventually you are going to play something more than once. So sometimes you're just refreshing, but a lot of times you'll get music for the first time. You learn it on your own. You practice it with a recording, you practice with a metronome, you know, anything that you, uh, any resources you can find. Fortunately, we live in a very uh, modern world with a lot of technology. Yeah. So we can listen to a lot of resources online. And so you do all that preparation ahead of time, and then you go to the rehearsals to get the experience with the conductor to find out what the conductor wants, um, mm. how fast we're actually going to take things, what kind of uh, elements of the piece they want to bring out, what kind they want to sort of fade into the back. Sure, and uh, sure. also working with the other musicians, coordinating with your stand partner, coordinating huh. with your section. Um, okay. It is a It is a big well-oiled machine that everyone kind of plays a part in yeah. and uh, it's a great experience because there is a lot of um, there's a lot of fun to it but there's also a lot of etiquette and protocol a lot of tradition that okay. um, what are some of the etiquettes and protocols so for example um, you have a section leader you have somebody who kind of makes decisions on your behalf for the section okay. and you kind of um, refer to them with any problems or concerns and usually this position is found through audition so you audition for the orchestra they uh, make sure that you know what you're doing, make sure that you're a good fit, and then they arrange you based on, usually based on your audition or your skill level. Mm -hmm. And so you have sort of a mentor built into the ensemble. And then, um, of course, you have your conductor, which, of course, you know, what he says goes. Historically, it used to be if, uh, you know, you made a mistake, the conductor could just fire you on the spot back in the day. But, of course, we're (laughs) we're a little different now. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we we have a lot of... uh, um, etiquette on stage as well. You know, everyone stands up when the conductor enters the room. The concertmaster, the first chair violinist, will turn and tune the orchestra to make sure they're all on the same pitch from the get go. So, who who does that? Uh, usually, the first chair violinist. First so that's chair. The, yep. Okay. So that's what we've heard of the person who auditioned. They sort of won the honor of being the number one violinist in the section. The soloist. This, yep. They're often the soloist. They're okay. often the um, if if it is an option in the orchestra. And then, of course, you can have soloists who are guests, where they come in and they play a solo. The orchestra accompanies them. Gosh, um, I actually yeah. had the opportunity to do that with the Dade City Symphony, and that is a great time to have a full orchestra yeah. behind you, accompanying yeah. you. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. 
So that's perfect uh, lead to my next question. So you um, you were the featured soloist in the Day City Symphony, mm-hmm. the Thursday Musicale, I believe. Yes. And the USF New Music Festival. Yes. So, so talk about those a little I've bit. I've done a lot of um, a lot of solo works for the New Music Festival because that's usually premieres for um, contemporary music pieces. So we would bring in these mm-hmm. composers, some of them local, but usually for the New Music Festival, we would actually bring in contemporary composers from all over the country. And they would fly in to hear their works played by um, staff and students. And so, oh, wow. I w- yeah, I got the chance to play some or premiere some pieces, actually, for composers that I got to meet in person. Where did you get the premiere? Yeah. Oh. Um, let's see. I did something by... Uh, you know, to be honest, I've done quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've done a lot for the ensembles, too. And I'll be honest, a lot of these pieces have some pretty bizarre names. Wow. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, but I remember... Um, getting to meet these composers and talk to them about these pieces. In fact, I remember um, playing one for a composer. He sent me the sheet music, and I didn't realize there was a printing error. So I'm trying to navigate this sheet music and found out that I was missing about half of it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think that was a piece by John Liberatore was the composer who did oh, that. I've okay. done some stuff by... Um, oh. Uh, I'm going to forget everybody's names now. That's now okay. <laughs> so, so what about mentors? Do you, um, mm-hmm. do you, it's, I find it's important to have someone that you kind of lean on to ask some questions, someone who's been there and someone who's mm-hmm. done that before. Sure. Do, do you have someone that you can lean on to ask questions? I feel like I collected a lot over the years. Um, <laughs> how'd, you, as, how'd you find them? So a lot of times through your education, you'll find a teacher, you'll find mm-hmm. a colleague, you'll find somebody that has been there, done that, especially yeah. in specific things. I know that... Um, when I was in our studio at USF, we had a buddy system where the new people came in and they had a mentor that was kind of assigned to them. Mm. And then, of course, later on, you kind of found more. And then later on, you find mentors sort of in these areas of music that you are um, that you are new to. For example, in a, in a classical or a conservatory setting, they don't necessarily teach you how to play for weddings. Okay. They will talk about it, but there's not really a class that teaches you how to gig. So finding mentors... In that area, I kind of collected information from all of my colleagues who'd been there for a longer time and asked them, like, sure. hey, um, you know, Isaac, how, what kind of music do you collect for your prelude music? Or I'll ask, you know, hey, Emily, how much do you charge for a gig that you have to travel this far for? Right. So I've collected a, a handful of people that I was able to refer to, and then it kind of turns into a brainstorming session. So I guess with music, we kind of become co-mentors to each other. Sure. And then, of course, our our teacher, our private teacher usually becomes that overarching, you know, the decision making kind of mentor that tells yeah. you do this or don't do that. <laughs> gotcha. So you just asked a lot of questions to people around you who, who knew and who had been there and done that already. Absolutely. Gotcha. I ask a lot of questions. I love brainstorming with other musicians. We kind of create our own community on our own. And yeah. like I said, the world gets smaller when, um, when you start working in music, everyone knows everybody eventually through, you know, two or three people's as far as connection goes. So eventually you will get a really good core group of people that like working with you. Sure. Awesome. Love it. Love it. So, um, and I'm going to touch on this. And so you had mentioned in the beginning that you know, you're no longer with them because you have the physical spot now, mm-hmm. but the boys and girls club in Dade city. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you were associated with them, the prodigy cultural arts program. Yes. What was that all about? That was a program that was actually all about, um, teaching arts to underprivileged kids okay. so that they could um, develop life skills, primarily um, anger management and communication mm. skills. And so they got to le- take these classes for free. They had to qualify. They went through an application process to make sure that um, it would benefit them the, the most. Sure. And then they got to take these classes for free. And we offered classes in um, visual art, in dance, and of course I did the music portion. And so I ended up with a group of kids all playing violin. The program actually purchased violins for them. We got, I got to have a hand oh, in like, right. yeah, it was a great program. And I was the first, from what I, from what I understand, I was the first violin teacher that this particular site had. So I was able to go through and sort of decide how things were going to go. And it was yeah. a great experience. The kids were great. Um, this was all happening during COVID actually. I got mm. this position. So I was doing a combination of in-person classes, which, by the way, sanitizing 20 violins, not fun. But you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Right. And so 
uh, I was also teaching online a lot of the group classes for kids who, who couldn't travel. So sure. we had a lot of fun teaching at home online. Uh, both my husband and myself were teaching music during COVID at home online. Sure. And I met everyone's pets. Yeah. I yeah. toured everyone's house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw instruments break on screen <laughs> occasionally. Yeah. It happened, you know. Sure. And um, no, it was a great program. It was really incredible seeing these kids. Um, some of them who had never even really touched an instrument before opening these violins for the first time and, and, yeah. you know, kind of calling dibs on it and calling it yeah, their own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they really enjoyed the experience of getting to play these instruments with each other. Uh, we usually met three times a week. So they had that sort of goalpost in their head of this is when we are going to be working through music. And they really, they had a great time with it. Of course we had our ups and downs during COVID. There were always challenges, Sure, but, yeah. um, we had we had a lot of fun and not everything always sounded perfect all of the time but at the end of the day sometimes what music teachers do has very little to do with the instrument and a lot of times it has to do with what kind of skills we can draw from playing the instrument yeah and so that was a great experience to sort of see the kids maybe they weren't you know super excited about playing a violin per se but they were excited to be able to collaborate with a friend and accomplish yeah. something that they could you know take a bow after absolutely yeah i love it so you, your degree is in violin performance yes when did you get interested in teaching music so i always had an interest in teaching i think i taught my first music lesson i used to play guitar my first instruments were right. uh was guitar actually okay. i think it was because that was the one instrument my mom didn't really want me to play <laughs> so i, I took guitar can you jam out on the guitar <laughs> yep. she's a nice. harpist okay. she, she was a harpist and a pianist she did not she was did not like the guitar so i went for the guitar got it <laughs> and so i played guitar i played a little bit of piano as a kid to a limit it wasn't really my thing um i like it i appreciate all those instruments a lot more now of course yeah but uh yeah so we played i played guitar originally i ended up with the violin in the long term but um, the teaching part came when I was learning the guitar. I remember teaching my first guitar lesson to somebody. I think I was 11, just because I really wanted to get them going on it. I thought they, they liked the guitar. I'm like, oh, I know a little bit. I'll show you. I was excited about it. I've always had a lot of satisfaction um, seeing people succeed at something new and seeing people um, walk away knowing something they didn't know when they came in. And I've always really enjoyed that experience. And I think that's kind of what led to teaching. So later on, I actually used that ability of teaching um, to kind of help me as well. I remember I worked for a summer camp in uh, West Virginia. It was a music camp for kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, I volunteered to work with the younger kids so that I could go to the music festival for the older kids so that I could participate. And they let me kind of do that exchange. So I used that opportunity for teaching to sort of help me as well. But mm -hmm. I learned just as much from teaching as I do from learning. I mean, learning as you teach is a big part of why musicians teach. Sure. Um, and of course, you know, some will tell you it's because it's, it's a consistent sort of aspect of what we do. But a big part of it is you will always learn a lot from watching other people learn it for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Fantastic. Now this portion of the show is sponsored by reliable resellers. Reliable resellers are based out of Tampa, Florida, one of the largest and fastest growing cities in the country with their well-established eBay store and local auction house connections. They provide a hassle free and profitable way to downsize your life. If you're in the Tampa area and in need of downsizing, call reliable resellers at 813-421-5676 or visit reliable resellers.net. All right, so now I assume at that time you were teaching and you were doing it mostly from your home at that point. I yes, assume, right? during COVID, yes. During COVID. Mm -hmm. now, did you have any noise? Were, were the neighbors <laughs> like, uh, did they hate you or was it not that loud? Fortunately, even though I lived in an apartment, my neighbors were, um, my husband and I were the youngest uh, people living in our apartment complex. And so they either really enjoyed the sound or they couldn't hear it. <laughs> Gotcha. Got there it. was a lot of uh, older yeah. people and they were they were so delightful and we really loved where we lived at the time so we were fortunate that no one complained too much at that time we taught virtually from home we never really taught in person at home just for reliability purposes and, and, and in general so we we always tried to organize another location to teach in person but when we were mm -hmm. online mm -hmm. it was a lot of fun because the the students actually got to see sort of what a full-time musician's living environment was like. I mean, yeah. they, they really got to, you know, they got to know my plants and <laughs> the paintings I had on the wall. They, they yeah. had a good time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Love it. So 
uh, I believe when I when when Jenna and I came over and, and we met you initially mm-hmm. and, and talked to you a little bit, I think you had mentioned to me that when you opened your physical spot, you guys already had twelve students. I yes. think at that point. How did you so? In the beginning, before you had your physical spot, how did you get your first couple of students? How did people know that you were available to teach music lessons? Um, the world gets smaller and smaller. Okay, okay. <laughs> Word of mouth, usually. It only okay. takes that one student, that one person that you already knew who was interested in taking a violin, and then they know someone who knows somebody. It usually spreads word of mouth. And if you think about it, word of mouth is the best advertising as far as yeah. getting an immediate response. Yeah. Because I know that whenever... Um, somebody tells me firsthand that they've had a good experience with a business or with a service, I'm more likely to go than if I just saw it on social media. Oh yeah. So word of mouth spread pretty quickly and we had been teaching private students local to Dade city for a while. Mm. And, um, that sort of spearheaded that that's what sort of grew that portion of our teaching. It's okay. (laughs) And, uh, whenever we were, um, moving into our new space, it was nice because we already knew we had these students who had been with us for a year or two. They'd been committed. They really enjoyed what we were doing. They were really supportive. And the fact that they could see their studio being put together, knowing that it was theirs. Yeah. Um, I like to say my, it's my student's studio. I just pay the bills, honestly. <laughs> it's their space. It's their playroom. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, we started with the 12 just through people knowing other people. We yeah. did do some advertising on the internet, but in general, we, okay. we liked people to know firsthand that they had a good experience with so us. So you did run a couple of ads? A little bit. We didn't okay. really pay for any. Yeah. That really wasn't our goal. We've had to pay for very little advertising in general with the world of social media. We haven't yeah. really had to shell yeah. out a lot of money for ads. But uh, so no, you've been like making pushes on Facebook groups and stuff like that, or yeah, we've been okay. mostly pushing through our own social media. Word of mouth okay. is still really strong. So now that we have grown, um, the word of mouth from that, you know, it's sort of like a spider web. Everything sort of webs out, and more people hear about us. Yeah, um, and of course, we do do some advertising through events. You know, we have a. Um, a really cool event once a month downtown called the Street Bash where we open up our doors and do an instrument petting zoo so kids can come in and play instruments, get an idea of what they're like, and see if it's something they want to pursue. Yeah. So th- events like that was really helpful too, getting the word out. Gotcha. Okay, cool. And so and as far as advertising now, you just, you don't, there's no need. I mean, you didn't do it in the beginning, so there's no need to Right, we did. We now. did pay for a couple of ads as an experiment. It's good to experiment, I think, in business just to see what works for your area and what works for your particular customer. Yeah. But... We definitely did invest in some advertising that we thought made sense with what we do. Um, We sponsored the band for the Street Bash because they were right across from us, set up on the street. It was music. It made perfect sense for us to put our name on that. And it was that thought of like, well, if there's a business going to put their name on the stage, it it has to be us, right? right. Like, that's not even a question. (laughs) Yeah. So... Back in 2020, when all the craziness started, mm-hmm. did, did the pandemic affect you guys? Did, it sounds like you were already doing remote teachings. So how did the pandemic affect you guys? We actually hadn't done any remote teaching before the pandemic. The pandemic oh. kind of forced it on us. Okay, got um, it. I used to swear up and down I would never do virtual lessons because yeah. um, not being able to adjust a violin, not being able to adjust an instrument sure. with a student, to me, just I, I didn't like the idea at all. But with the pandemic, you know, what choice did we have? So we were kind of pushed into the virtual teaching. Mm. And then COVID was a fascinating time as a musician in general because we had all these colleagues around us that we could see how they were reacting to COVID really told us a lot about the music industry because Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we had some people who didn't have a choice but to fold and find either another job or find another income source because Mm -hmm. um, if they lived in New York or if they lived in California, there was no way for any of those kinds of things that made them consistent income to continue. And so they had to find another avenue. But the people closer to home, the people closer to us who... um, were they had some resources they were able to teach they were able to do things from home it was fascinating to see some musicians sort of um completely twist their way of thinking from oh my gosh the world is ending what are we going to do to how can i profit from this how can i make this happen because people need music whether they can be in person or not and even though we were not considered a necessary resource we weren't considered um, you know, as important as a restaurant or as food, right. people still needed us. Of course. And so people found our colleagues that found a way to make money off of this anyway, were really the ones that had the entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah. And at the end of the day, a lot of times as a creative, anything, if it's a uh, music or if it's art, if you don't have that 
willingness to be your own entrepreneur and to be your own boss yep. in situations like that, you have to find another yeah. way. You have to yep. find an alternative. Yep. Um, because if you aren't willing to be your own boss, I feel like a lot of musicians didn't make it. They didn't sure. survive the pandemic as a musician. They had to find another avenue, yeah. which is perfectly fine in, in a lot of cases. But for us, it wasn't an option. We loved what we did. We'd already been full-time musicians for several yeah. years. And fortunately, enough people were bored at home <laughs> yeah. that we were able to continue doing what we loved yeah. through the whole thing. We actually continued being full-time musicians yeah. all through 2020. Yeah. I love that story. So, and you got, you found a way. Yeah. So, so rather than just packing it in saying, Oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? Absolutely. You, you, you found a way that entrepreneurial spirit came out and you said, okay, we're going to, we're going to do the virtual. We're just going to try it. We'll try some things. We'll yep. figure it out and, and we'll, we'll, we'll make adjustments along the way. Absolutely. This is what we, we had to do. In fact, our LLC formed during COVID because we finally had the time to sit down and do it. And yeah. like, well, this is, it's now or never. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. So then in November of 2021, on the 12th to be exact, yes. so six months ago yesterday, yep. right? Oh yeah, I guess so. You yep. guys opened your physical location there in downtown Dade City. We did. And uh, yep, we took over where one of our favorite cafes used to be. Um, and uh, when, when she was ready to expand and have a bigger space, we talked to her about what was going on with the space she was leaving. And yeah. so one thing led to another and we ended up taking over that space. We started um, renting the space, I think in the beginning of October, and then six weeks later, um, the construction was finally finishing up. Were so, you nervous? Oh, <laughs> there, it was not really. I mean, yes, really? And, yes, and no. There was there was there was some nervous. I think that uh, since I grew up in an entrepreneurial, an entrepreneur mind at home, I was yeah. used to the risks of business. I was used to the experience of working with people. Yeah. For me, it wasn't that scary. For my husband, it was terrifying. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Fortunately, I, I was kind of leading him around with this idea of starting a business on our own. And he he was nervous. Um, he went from terrified to just nervous. And now he is just as gung-ho and forward thinking as I am, which yeah. is great. Yeah. But no, at first it did scare him because it was new. And for me, it was, you know something that I'd watched other people do for so long. It wasn't as scary for me. Um, construction was scary. I'm not good at drywall. I learned that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. fortunately, our family, since we were used to running a family business all those years, when I sort of brought up this idea to my family, that was, uh, it, it was a, I didn't even have to ask. They were like, all right, well, this is the materials that you're going to need. This is the time it's going to take. They were awesome. ready. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So what was the catalyst? What made you go from working from your house and doing the virtual trainings mm -hmm. to open them, opening that physical place? Um, opportunity. The, the space came up, became available. It was something that we could afford with what we had saved up for this opportunity. And so it was sort of a, if we don't do it now, mm -hmm. when, it, when is it ever going to be better? It, right. It's, we don't know what's the future is going to hold as far sure. as businesses in the area and as far as available space. Yep. And we were so close to, like-minded spaces like we were right next to the art gallery how cool is that to have music and art next door to each other yeah so it was more of a this is clearly a sort of a meant to be situation it would be wrong for us to pass it up yeah and so I did leave it up to Paul I did leave it up to my husband to kind of do the final say because he was the one who was nervous and then finally he said yep let's do it let's see what happens yeah let's let's go for it and so yeah, yeah, yeah. we we went ahead for it our students were super excited and we started to grow before we actually entered the space just because people knew a space was coming oh no way which was super cool again th mostly through word of mouth from our existing students and so yeah. when we opened the space we made a whole weekend of it i don't know if i would recommend this to other business owners or not <laughs> we actually um did a whole weekend of events we did our grand opening i think on the friday and um we really tried to make a big deal of it. We emailed a whole bunch of people. We, I think I invited all of our city commissioners. I invited the chamber. I invited all of these different people. Yeah. And uh, so we did the grand opening on the Friday. The Saturday, we had an open house. We had an instrument petting zoo to let kids come in, tour the studio, try the instruments. And then on Sunday, we had sponsored um, Homegrown New Music, which is a new music ensemble out of Tampa. Mm. Um, we invited them to do a concert in the park right behind our facility. So... We had a whole weekend of events. That was an exhausting weekend. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but it brought a lot of people into our space. And it was a really good kickoff because maybe if the public didn't see this event, they might see the one that we were doing on Saturday or they might right. see. So it right. was it was an adventure. It was a lot of fun. And meanwhile, just hoping that all of our new construction was holding together. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Extremely impressive. And you just you guys coordinated all of this. You you, you worked out with the, the 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 band to come and play. Like you guys mm -hmm. coordinated all of this stuff right as you're opening the store. Yes, we don't sleep much. <laughs> yeah. So what's it 
it been like so far? I mean, it's been a great experience. Um, this is something that Dade City seems to want, and that was something that was the big risk is to decide if the community could support something like this. Yeah, and so far we've been really happy with the reaction we've had. We had a lot of people coming in who wanted private lessons and then we had some people coming in who were asking about group classes and then we have people coming in asking about summer camps and so we've been trying to meet all of those requests yeah. um, within reason to make sure that it's something that we can do well and so we've had a great response so far in six months we've gone from 12 students to I think including our group classes about 50 Wow. So we were not expecting growth that quickly. Um, we started planning for our summer camps, I think, around January. Um, okay. I used to work with summer camps when I was in West Virginia, so it's something I'm comfortable with. And uh, we started planning it in January, and by the end of March, our first week of camp was already full. So people nice. are excited to get out, and people yeah. are excited to do things right now. And yeah. so uh, we did expand. We expanded to the space next door to us. Um, within a few months of opening, Shut just you <laughs> we weren't prepared. I, uh, <laughs> it just happened. Our neighbor, he was such a great guy. He he decided to to move his business out of that space, mm -hmm. and so um, I went over there and I said, "You couldn't you couldn't have stayed like six months longer. We're not quite ready, but yeah. we decided that." You know, we don't know what kind of business is going to go here. What if they hate noise? <laughs> right. So we decided it's, you know, now or never. Again, that attitude of bite the bullet and let's do it. And yes. so we added the other space so that we Love were able it. to accommodate a drum room. Yeah. Yeah. So now that we don't have to share all of our walls with somebody, yeah. we can accommodate the louder instruments now. Yeah. Love it. Okay. So your business is based out of Dade City. Mm-hmm. Why Dade City? What what, do you, what what is it about Dade City that made you open your business here? So Paul and I did a lot of our growing up in Dade City, and we know that there's a lot coming for Dade City. It is that small town feel, but we are in an area close enough to places like Wesley Chapel in Tampa where people want that small town experience for their family while still being convenient to the more... Um, to the, to the city luxuries, you know, yes. being able, like we can drive to Disney and then we can go home to our small town and yeah. have that feel. Yeah. And so we love the small town feel. We always really have. We both lived in Tampa for a time and I really appreciate the convenience of Tampa, but I hated living there to be totally yeah. honest. Yeah, I, 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 I like being able to go into a coffee shop where the owner already knows what I want. You know, I like being able to go into the grocery store and see people that I know and, and yeah. recognize them. I, I yeah. like that experience that, that, um, that safe feeling of knowing that you you walk home from somewhere knowing that you can wave to like three or four people, you know, on the way. Yeah. And I, I really enjoy that. And so does Paul. So we decided that this was the area we wanted to see grow. This is the area that we wanted to invest in. Cause this is the area that invested in us. Yeah. And so the area in general we always kind of felt like it was going in more of the arts direction. We'd like it to be known as sort of an arts community. Sure. We do have a lot already, but we're hoping that it ex continues to expand as time goes on. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So uh, let's talk about funding for a minute. Mm -hmm. Funding can be tough, <laughs> um, especially in the beginning when no one really has heard of you or really maybe even believes in you other than yourself right. and maybe your own personal <laughs> family, right? Did, did you seek out like outside investors? Did you take out a bunch of loans? Did you go to like mom and dad and say, please, or did credit cards? <laughs> like, how did you do it? So this was purely on Paul's side. Okay. So he actually, about six or seven years ago, started doing heavy research in investing. And so okay. he started investing quite a while ago. And we've always lived sort of a, a more simple lifestyle we don't yeah. do international travel we don't spend a lot of money on like fast cars or anything like that we, yeah. we we stick to investing money into our craft into our music into our education yeah. and so he started pulling money and and investing and when he was explaining to me what he was doing I told him he was crazy I think I I was very nervous the idea of of investing money into something that we didn't know what it was going to do scared me yeah and so he, of course, ignored me and, and went gung-ho with it at the time. It was before we were even married. So what was I? Well, I didn't really have a say in his finances anyway. So we, right. <laughs> he just went gung-ho with it. Well, he ended up being very skilled in the research that he was doing. And mm -hmm. so we were able to fund our startup strictly with money that we had invested and um, being able to pull some of that resource out for the space and then, again, for the additional space so that awesome. we had a way to... And, of course, too, our business very different from opening a restaurant, for example. Um, to teach instruments, of course, we already had instruments. We were already, you know, 
musicians who worked full time as musicians. We we already had a lot of our equipment from the get go that was mm. already invested in, and so really all we needed was a room and electricity and simple things like that. It wasn't like if we were purchasing a retail store or if we were going into the restaurant business where we had to do all of this yeah. equipment and all right. of this stuff up front. Right. So. Fortunately with us, that was pretty straightforward. All we really needed was the space. Gotcha. And gotcha. we were able to fund that without any loans. So far, so far, awesome. so good. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> and we're very grateful for that. We know that that's quite a luxury to be able yeah, to do that. Yeah. yeah. So, so you, you, you had the entrepreneur. So he was concerned in the beginning about taking the step on the entrepreneurial side yes. and you were concerned about taking the step on the investment. Exactly. Side. So it's a good a, compliment, a fit. Yeah, right? It's a perfect fit. Yep. He said, he's the money guy and I'm the face. Yeah. That's why I'm here. And he's right on, right <laughs> he's at the on. studio I love today. It. I love it. So now <clears throat> I read over your website and your Academy teaches a wide variety of musical instruments. Yes. And it's just you and your husband. I mm-hmm. mean, is that, is that, um, is that typical for a, a, a music school to have just a couple of instructors teaching 20 plus things? Oh, yes. It's most musicians, especially the entrepreneur-minded ones who want to really go forward and be successful, they learn a lot of instruments. Gotcha. Um, At school, we're all actually required to learn piano, for example. So Mm. if you, whether you went to school for voice or for trombone, it doesn't matter, you will learn piano. (laughs) Gotcha, okay. So you're already a multi-instrumentalist when you leave school. And of course, we've been multi-instrumentalists from the get-go just because we love music in general and it's like well I can play a violin let's give ukulele a shot you know eventually we sort of adapt to all these different instruments depending on what's trending and what people are interested in and of Mm -hmm, course mm -hmm. what people are in demand for yeah um I remember we were planning a concert this was actually one of Paul's compositions um and the violist dropped out two days before the performance for whatever reason. And so I learned to play the viola in two days (laughs) (laughs) because it was easier to replace me as a violinist than to replace a viola. So I'm like, well, I'm learning viola. (laughs) So we, (laughs) we learn a lot of instruments to be able to adapt to different scenarios. And so we like being able to pass that on to other people. So Yeah. yeah, it's not unusual if you meet, um, musicians who teach in studio settings, most of the time they do teach several instruments and we're no exception. So that's why, but you notice it's mostly strings and, um, percussion. And that is primarily what we do. Unfortunately, I'm not good at breathing into instruments. I, if it requires me to breathe, if I can't snack and play it at the same time, I don't know. So (laughs) (laughs) I've got a lot to learn still. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So I, I believe in uh, that ye, the Prelude Academy has a 2022 summer camp coming up. Yes. Okay. Talk about the summer camp a little bit. What's involved? What all are people going to learn? And how can a student sign up? Great. So the student actually doesn't have to have any musical experience to come to camp. So okay. we are we are going to have some of our current students that are going to be there who already know how to play and already know each other. Mm-hmm. But we are going to have some who've never touched an instrument before. And this is going to be their first run at it. Yeah. So what they're going to be doing is they're going to be um, taking a class in a uh, program called ORF, which is primarily auxiliary percussion and a lot of things with uh, with rhythm sticks and bells and scarves and folk dancing and folk music and all these things. I'm actually bringing in a colleague of mine from out of state who's certified to teach ORF. So she's going to mm. come in and work with the kids on that. So that'll okay. be really fun. Okay. Um, they're going to get to play their instrument of choice. So for this camp, we're starting small. So they their options were keyboard, uh, violin, and cello. Okay. And they're going to get to play in ensembles, like small ensembles with each other with that and learn yeah. how to do that. They're going to be doing art classes. The uh, Out of Our Hands Art Gallery is going to come in and teach an art class with them. No way. And so, Very cool. So that's going to be a good time. And then we're going to do a performance at the end of the week, too. We're also going to include some snacks and some music history and some music theory. Um, I have a variety of costume pieces. I think I have a full on Mozart costume stash somewhere. We're going to break that out. Nice. You know, might as well. Yeah. And we're going to make sure the kids get a lot of information, but also have a good time. That's the priority is yeah. to have fun. So how long is it and how do they sign up? So the first week is for ages five through 10. Okay. And it's actually already full. I've got mm. a wait list though. If I get enough kids, I'll do another one for that okay. age group. And that is the 13th through the 17th of June. Okay. And then the week following that is for ages 11 through 15. There's still some room there and they can do all of the signing up online in fact we've tried to make everything as friendly I'm, most of our the parents of our kids um, are scrolling these days more so than they are reading a newspaper so yeah, we have tried yeah. to incorporate everything on our website that Perfect. we can and um, all of our applications there's also scholarship applications for kids who um, need a little financial help to get to camp or for sure. their lessons sure. and so we have all that online too so preludeacademy.com is where they go to sign up that's right awesome now i also believe you have a sponsor program 
where people can in the community they can sponsor a student to take lessons yes or maybe even for the summer camp so how do people go about sponsoring a student and what's involved with that so there is an application online and it's been a combination of businesses and individuals okay um they go online they they sign up they pledge how much money they want to spend yeah there's a laundry list of things that they can sponsor they can sponsor everything from summer camp to private lessons to even the toddler classes so oh, our, okay. our youngest our youngest students are only 15 months old and wow. uh, yeah, okay. the, toddler, oh, early. The, the toddler classes are a lot of fun. It's mostly instilling like a sense of beat and rhythm and uh, tonal patterns. They're learning the difference between like major and minor scales at the age of like two. It's incredible. Yeah. And so they can even sponsor things like that. You can sponsor okay. instruments, books. Um, yeah, all you have to do is fill out the application. So we have an idea of where you want your money to go. Yeah. And then students can go online and apply for this. They can actually, um, they write a small essay or if they're too young to write, they'll make a small video basically explaining why they want to be a part of the studio, why they want to play music, I basically give them an idea of, um, you know, why, why they want to come make sure they're invested and they're excited about it. And, uh, then we match up the funds with the student in need. So. Gotcha. And so the same way they just go to preludeacademy.com to yep. figure out more about that. Exactly. Everything's there. Awesome. So uh, Charlotte, what are some of the future plans for, I mean, I, I know it's been six months, yep. but you've already expanded once. <laughs> Do you have any other future plans right now? Or is it kind of just going with the flow or, you know, are you adding more instructors or kind of what's, what's yeah, in the future for you Yeah, we would guys? love to add some more instructors. We want to make sure that it's instructors who are really, um, want to be a part of it in a, in a, in a good way knowing that they are going to be the teacher for that instrument. We're not going to bring in 20 teachers who do the same instrument. That's not necessary. We'd rather have one or two who really know what they're doing, who are really invested in the community, really invested in their instrument and teaching. Gotcha. And we want them to have a good experience, just like we want the kids to have a good experience. So we're still looking for some some teachers who can teach the instruments that we don't teach. Yeah. <laughs> I am unfortunately a terrible clarinet player. So <laughs> if we uh, bring in some wind and brass teachers in the future, we're really excited about that. Okay. We're kind of waiting for just the right person to walk through the door, you know? Yeah, sure. Um, so far, a lot of what we do has just been sort of a meant to be, fall into place situation. And we kind of don't push too much for things that aren't meant to be. So yeah. we're kind of waiting to see who that person is who's going to walk in the door and just really want to be a Prelude Academy teacher. Understood. So we're excited for that growth. We would love to start a youth symphony in the future. Okay. Um, okay. Paul was actually conducted the USF Health Orchestra for a time, so he has experience with conducting. We'd love mm. to be able to offer that to the youth. Uh, the Dade City Symphony is awesome. Unfortunately, you, can, you have to be 18. You have to be a certain age to play. Mm. Mm. And so giving them sort of a feeder group to be able to have young kids who are ready to to play with the older orchestra when it gets to that time yeah. we'd love to invest in something like that so we're hoping that for the future um, not interested in adding any more space just yet we're still getting used to where we are yeah. um, but so far we're having a really good time making these these plans we were actually talking today about maybe for just a fun event doing a haunted house at Halloween we were oh, talking no about way. that okay. yeah we also I mean it, although a lot of what we do is music education and we want a quality music education because we want independent musicians. We're not going to be around forever. We want to make sure that they can go and apply this information with other teachers, with other ensembles, with other instruments. And yeah. so we're very serious about making sure that all of our kids and adults, we have a wide range of, of student ages. We want to make sure that they really know what they are getting themselves into. They really understand the theory and the structure and the science behind how music works. Sure. Um, but we also want to have a good time. And yeah. I mean, I we... We try to be a part of events that are existing. We're looking forward to planning some of our own in the future, and we both just love Halloween. So we're like, hey, let's do this for the kids. It'd be Got fun. It. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. So the next question here, so I did some sort of crowdsourcing, and I reached out to Reddit, and I asked, there's a violinist subreddit, and I said, hey, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing an interview. I'm, I'm interviewing a classically trained violinist. Give me some questions. Oh, and cool. uh, this is one of the questions that they came up with. Okay. So if someone is interested in learning to play the violin, but mm -hmm. they're just starting out, how does someone get started? What types of violins would you recommend? And what general advice do you have for beginners? Oh, awesome. So definitely when you are learning in the beginning, now not everyone has this resource. So I, I say this delicately. If you have access to a private teacher, you will have a far better and faster experience in the beginning than you would if you tried to learn on your own. Okay. It is awesome that we have all these resources online where you can, you know, teach yourself the violin on YouTube. We have so many of those. And some of those resources are great, but it doesn't quite take the place of somebody telling you, no, put your finger here or yeah. no, adjust this this way. Right. That really is an incredible asset to have with your, especially beginning stages, to learn it right the first time. 
And so investing in a private teacher whenever possible. Okay. Um, usually if you have found a classically trained teacher who likes that personal investment in your music education, they will typically go with you to pick out your violin. Oh, wow, I, okay. I actually like gotcha. to meet students at the place. I play it with them because they're, they're still beginning. They're not quite sure. They don't have quite the experience to play the instrument, to see what it can do and see what it sounds like. So typically right. I go with them. I play the instrument with them, set it up on them, yeah. play it for them so they know what it can do, what it sounds like, and then mm. we make decisions from there. Gotcha. So if you can find somebody who will invest in your education, invest their time into helping you pick the instrument that's perfect for you. Mm -hmm. That makes a mm -hmm. world of difference. And that solves so many problems <laughs> from the get go. Gotcha. And, um, in general, practicing effectively practice quality over quantity. I think a lot of people say, Oh, you need to be playing four hours a day. And for professionals, we do a lot of the time, yeah. but when you're beginning, it's better to do those 10 minutes of really quality, effective practice than to be doing four hours of nothing. Sure. And yeah. so yeah. I think that would be my first thought. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right on rock on. I love it. So Charlotte, what is a, what does a typical day look like for you? Are, are, do you have a structure to your day? Are, are you, um, an exercise yoga meditation person? Do, are you, uh, do, are you just sort of haphazard go with the flow? How do you structure your days? Ooh, structure. That's, that's a word that doesn't go with our schedule very well. <laughs> I mean, of course our students are, you know, their schedule is very structured. They have their set lesson time weekly and yeah. we have to divvy that up among, you know, however many students. So that part's pretty structured. That part's pretty continuous and consistent, mm -hmm. but <laughs> uh, I love to say that I'm like a yoga exercise person, but yeah. unfortunately because the rest of our schedule is so unusual. I feel like all musicians can say this pretty confidently. Their schedule is so unusual that having that consistent, you know, 7 a.m. exercise routine, not necessarily common among <laughs> among entrepreneurs like us with music. Yeah, yeah. Um, because in addition to the studio, we are also freelance musicians. We also still do gigs. We still do performances. We still do workshops and things like that. Sure. So no, our schedule pretty much outside of the scheduled lessons that we do changes all the time. And I think, well, I mean, I think last, last week, a couple weeks ago, we drove to St. Pete on a Friday night to play for an antique book fair. And then, you know, today I'm, I drove out here to do a podcast, yeah, you know, right. our, our schedule is constantly adjusting and sure. we love that. We don't really like that stagnant. This is the same way every day kind of lifestyle. That's why we are in the creative arts, I guess. Yeah. Um, we like that, you know, in a couple of days, we're just going to decide to, Oh, you know what? We don't have a lot of foot traffic. We're going to go play music on the street. You know, yeah, we yeah. like having that freedom and that, love it. Love it. Now, okay, so I have found that oftentimes people will, um, they'll talk themselves out of taking a chance. They'll talk themselves out of doing something or starting a business. It's, it's generally, they have these laundry list of reasons why they can't or shouldn't do something. And, and, you know, they'll, they'll tell themselves that they have these, these thoughts of self doubt and disbelief creep in. Um, you have obviously found a way to deal with those. You have started a business. You're, you're, you're doing your thing. You're, you're very successful. So I'm, what are your tricks to dealing with those thoughts of self doubt and mm -hmm. disbelief? How do you deal with it? I, I think that I learned how to deal with imposter syndrome very early <laughs> because uh, I remember when I went to school for music, I had only been playing violin seriously for about four years before I went to my university, before I auditioned for a university mm -hmm. and I only auditioned for one. And I remember getting in and I remember walking into that building that first day and thinking, what am I doing here? How dare I? I mean, some of these people have been playing these instruments since they were four and I'm just sure. waltzing into this building. How, you know, what audacity do I have? You know, I felt terrible about it. And that imposter syndrome mm -hmm. lived with me for quite a while, mm -hmm. especially going in and knowing so little compared to what so many people knew. Yeah. And so, I learned to deal with that because I saw how um, things like um, degrees or things like um, or e even programs that are supposed to teach you these things, they don't mean anything if you don't do something with them. Yeah. There were some really incredible musicians I've seen with the same sort of experiences and even more so than I do. And if they don't work hard to pursue it, if they don't chase after what it is that they're interested in, what it is that they've invested in, yeah. that it's useless. It doesn't do them any good if they aren't still constantly pushing. And so we learned very early, and I think COVID influenced this a lot too. We learned that if you are not 
constantly pursuing what you want to do, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. it's not going to fall into your lap. It's not just going to happen. You yeah. have to constantly be pushing. You have to be hungry for what you want. Yeah. And so we've always kind of had that attitude since our sort of professional side of music came into play. We learned that um, just because they are an incredible musician doesn't necessarily mean that they're good at promoting themselves as an incredible musician. Right. Um, it's better to be a entrepreneur minded musician who does well and is constantly working than to be, you know, this crazy, incredible prodigy level musician Mm -hmm. who doesn't know how to market themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So in in this sort of realm, of course there's the world where you can audition for an orchestra and then you have this, you know, this consistency, the security, and you have the health insurance, you have all that. And that's awesome, but it's Mm -hmm. so competitive. And as Mm -hmm. we saw with COVID, you never know what's going to happen to it. So I guess the self-doubt went away when we saw that the only way to really be a full-time musician is to really be a full-time musician, to discover all aspects of running the business and running the marketing while also trying to hone your craft. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) That's probably why I don't have time for yoga. (laughs) Yeah, 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 I got you. Yep, yep. So you're also an ambassador for the Dade City Chamber of Commerce. You do so much. You're an ambassador <laughs> for the Dade City Chamber of Commerce, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and I'm actually going to, I will be your guest next Tuesday. I'm yeah. going to go for the lunch. I'm excited awesome. about that. Mm-hmm. So how did you get involved with them? What, and what does being an ambassador entail? So I was involved with the Dade City Heritage Museum. So not long after we sold our museum in West Virginia and came back to Dade City full time, um, my mom and I started running the Dade City Heritage Museum. Mm. And so through that, I became an ambassador of the Chamber of Commerce because I, uh, I was actually invited by another ambassador. They said, you know, you're seeing all these people okay. through the museum. You're, you're getting to know all these different business owners because of what the museum entails. Yeah. Um, you might as well come and, and start recruiting for the chamber. And, you know, you get to eat breakfast for free if you're an ambassador, that kind of a thing. Yeah. They were in and I'm like, oh, all right, so we'll give it a shot. And so I got to have the experience of meeting all these different business owners and sort of connecting them as well. I really enjoyed making connections. Again, I like I like seeing people succeed at something new. And so seeing people succeed at networking or succeed at um, sort of learning how to be their own business person through these social events and being able to get to know others. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. And I still do. And so I think that our chamber is really important for for the community i'm looking forward to how it's going to grow in the future i'm and i wanted to be a part of that i wanted to make sure you know it can't succeed if there's no one involved and i I wanted to make sure that it continued and so So. that's part of what you do as an ambassador is help help to grow and and add more food right we're the we're the feet on the street basically we're the ones who go door to door and say hey would you like to join the chamber there's snacks and networking (laughs) (laughs) gotcha right on okay now, this is a, another question here that mm-hmm. we've crowdsourced. This one's from Jenna. Okay. Um, so as someone who has strongly considered taking the leap into entrepreneurship, mm-hmm. how did you know it was the right time to leave working for someone else and invest 100% into yourself and your own vision? Oh, that's tough because I did struggle with that, um, particularly with the Prodigy program because I really, I really loved working with those kids, but trying to juggle that and coming back to our private studio, it was a lot of back and forth. It was a lot of mental energy. It was a lot of instrument moving. (laughs) It was a lot of a lot. And so that was a struggle to decide when to stop doing the other things and to focus hundred percent on your own business. Because, um, we did try to transition slowly so that we could be smart about it and we could, you know, sort of be responsible about it. Of course, then, you know, your neighbor moves out and you expand before you're ready and, you know, you can't predict these things. So yeah. it didn't matter anyway. But I mean, yeah. we we were very careful thinking about it. But at the end of the day, um, we were getting phone calls and people asking for lesson times where I was at another organization or where I was working for somebody else. Yeah. Or we had people who wanted to schedule these calls and these sessions and these things for times that I just couldn't. And being able, and telling people no as a new business, it doesn't look good. It doesn't right. look good telling people like, well, no, I can't do that because I have my other job. That doesn't, yeah. it, it doesn't really... It doesn't really look like you're fully committed. It doesn't feel like you're fully committed. And right. and I'm very much an all or nothing kind of person. Yeah. Um, you know, I could have just played violin for fun, but nope, nope. I got to get the degree. I'm going to go all in. <laughs> I, I, we're, we're both very much an everything or none of it kind of personality, which, yeah. um, you know, now more so than ever, because now I've convinced Paul on the entrepreneur side, he's convinced me on the financial risk side, you know, all yeah. of it or none of it, as long as we can do it as responsibly as possible. Sure. Still, I mean, people respect people who are all in with their business. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what I'm hearing is then, so basically you got to a point where your, your, um, music teaching just got so big Mm -hmm. that it, it, 
was overtaking the time you had with the other stuff. And so you just put all your effort into that. At yes. That point. Yeah. And it was definitely, it was definitely good timing in general because, uh, the the kids that I w- that I left through the program it it broke my heart actually they they wrote me a little goodbye note using materials that were mine actually like they used my pen it was really funny <laughs> but <laughs> and I, it was it was devastating but at the same time I know that um, sometimes an opportunity like that is maybe meant for someone else now maybe it's time for somebody else to step in and, and be that person and so yeah. um, I tried to think of it that way in that. Moving forward 110% into our business, that mm-hmm. was what all of this was about. That was mm-hmm. what our whole goal was, was to be independent and to be able mm-hmm. to do our own thing mm-hmm. and to be the entrepreneur. It was good timing. It was good timing to to go all in so that people didn't have to keep calling to an answering machine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. Okay, well, I mean, we're going to start winding down. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, are there any topics that we didn't cover that you would like to talk about? Anything about your academy, about your background, anything at all? Any tips and tricks for aspiring entrepreneurs? Mm-hmm. Anything you'd like to talk about that we haven't covered? Oh, sure. So um, I'm not sure about inspiring entrepreneurs. I'm still one that's still a budding entrepreneur, I guess you could say. But I think that. When you go into being an entrepreneur, especially when you're looking at leaving everything else behind and you're looking at going full in into what you want to do, mm-hmm. um, being aware that no one's going to care about your business as much as you do. Yep. No one's going to fight for your business as much as you're going to, no matter who you network with. And so going forward and being that perfect advocate for yourself and for your business. And that's really hard. I think especially for musicians, it's really hard. It's hard for us to talk about ourselves. It's hard for us to, mm-hmm. um, like, for example, it's hard for me to remember composers' names, apparently. <laughs> uh, like, it's hard for us. And I will be honest, a lot of the times, like, re- uh, recording recording has always actually made me really nervous. Um, I've always loved performing live for people to have that experience with them. But you yeah. know what? I'm learning something. But I think that getting out of your comfort zone and being your own best advocate, even when it's hard, and even when people are asking questions that you don't have answers for, even when people are trying to get information out of you that maybe you haven't figured out yet, being your own best advocate and being your own best promotion person. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Because in the beginning, you are everything. I mean, I am the, unfortunately, secretary. It's not something that I love, but (laughs) I'm the, I'm the secretary. I am the staff. I am the janitor. I'm everything. And so is my husband. We are wearing so many hats. And so if you're going to wear all those hats, you might as well promote them well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Okay. Awesome. So we're going to finish here with, I have what I call my three quick question round. Mm-hmm. It's just what I call it. Um, so first question, how would you define the word entrepreneur? Ooh. Um, when I think entrepreneur, I think the word I think first, and actually I listened to your last episode and I remember, um, I think it was Mary Catherine's answer mm-hmm. to this. And I have to say, I really agree with a lot of what she said. And I actually asked Paul this too, because I, I wondered if you would ask me too, yeah. <laughs> um, like, what does this mean to you? And so we had this conversation. We both agreed. It means the freedom to do things the way you want to do it. And I think a lot of times when you work for somebody else, it's that feeling of, I have to do things the way they want me to do it, or I have to do things the way this person wants me to do it. And I have mm-hmm. to follow this rule. And like, if I don't do it right, what if I lose my job kind of a thing? Mm-hmm. We don't have that. And we have the freedom to, well, we have the freedom to, to come and be on a podcast on a, you know, in the middle yeah. of the morning. So it's having that freedom to be able to just stop what you're doing and do what you want to do for your business. Yeah. I think that freedom is what we really went for. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So, okay. Question number two, how would you define the word success? Ooh, now that's a hard one because I think success can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Yes, indeed. And I know, especially as musicians, when people think success, they think like, oh, you're a household name, you're on TV, you played at Carnegie Hall, all of these things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, I think that for us, I think success means the people that we are impacting, the, our, our clientele are succeeding. In other words, they are seeing improvement in what they're doing every day. And when they feel those little successes, then we have done our job, yeah. um, at, at least to the best of our ability. I think that success meaning we are meeting a need in the community and we are doing it well. Yeah. I think well, that's the, that's what we're going for. <laughs> right on. So now when you think of the word successful, mm-hmm. who comes to mind? Ooh, that's a great question, actually. Um, when I think successful, 
I think of people who have found a way to make a living doing what they love. And I guess I don't think of people making millions of dollars off of what they do. And maybe that's because most musicians don't. But I think that uh, successful to me is people making a lifestyle that works for them, Mm -hmm. creating an Mm -hmm. income that they can live off of comfortably Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and continue to do what they love and continue to impact people in the way that they want to. Sure. I think that's what I think of. That's my first thought is people who have found a way to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Love it. Okay. Well, I mean, how can people find you? What's uh, we so we plugged your website, but plug mm-hmm. it again. Um, give all your social media stuff, mm-hmm. any different events, any different uh, weddings or orchestras you have coming up. Just how can people find you and sign up for all your different programs and plug your, plug your stuff. Absolutely. So we are, all of our student information is on preludeacademy.com. You can find out information about summer camp, about our toddler classes, about our private lessons, all of that good stuff. You can mm-hmm. also read the bios for um, Paul and myself. Mm-hmm. Um, if you are interested in social media, we're trying really hard to learn how to be good social media people. <laughs> and uh, that is a whole realm in and of itself. And so yeah. we, uh, yeah. we're we trying to get better at it. So we're on Instagram and Facebook at Prelude Academy. Um, you can also find us. Let's see. We're involved with the Dade City Symphony. You could see us performing with that. We're on YouTube, scattered here and there. If you search Paul Lewis, Charlotte Lewis, you'll find us. Um, everything from uh, contemporary music where we are on a big concert stage to <laughs> um, I'm actually doing some I think I did some video game covers this past year too for nice. with, a, with a colleague of mine so a wide variety of music that we've done okay. that you can find online on YouTube if you search us and in general if you follow us on social media that's where most of our most current information is we are at the studio um, six days a week we're there 10 to 7 Monday through Friday 10 to 2 on Saturdays and uh, if we're not there, we are not far away. We're probably getting coffee. Gotcha. So, so you can always call us and you can always message us. You can always find us through social media. We try to stay on top of our email, phone, all of that stuff as much as quickly as possible. We like yeah. to get back to people when we're still in their minds. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Uh, Miss Charlotte Lewis, thanks a lot for being here. Well, this was you. great. I really enjoyed this conversation. Me too. And everyone else. Thanks a lot for tuning in. If you've enjoyed the show, I would just ask that you please share it around so others can join in as well. The best way for new listeners to find the show is for our current listeners to talk about us. So give us a like, give us a comment, and give us a subscription. Uh, I'm your host, Eric Baker. This has been another episode of The Art of Business. Bye for now.